My name is Shauna Gregory. I'm the Chief Program Officer at Women Who Code, and I'm so glad to have you all join this conversation. It's all about making an impact while you're building your tech career. I loved learning about all of the incredible uh, organizations you volunteer your time, your talent, and donations to, and that's what this session's all about. So I'm really excited to have our panelists share their experience with you. Um, so we asked our attendees to tell us all about things that are really important to you and, and make an impact in your life. And I'm going to ask our panelists to uh, please give a quick introduction, share your name, uh, what you do full-time in your job, and what your Women Who Code role is. Uh, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Kelly. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Amlos, uh, she, her. Professionally, my day job uh, is a as an engineering manager at a company called Paxos. I joke that that's the job I do that pays me. And then I have uh, a couple other ones, including being a now senior director for Women Who Code. Um, I've also been a director for the New York City chapter, which for those of you who don't know, and this is going to be the case for all of the speakers, um, the directors are primarily res uh, responsible for overseeing their networks, creating their events, and also uh, identifying and then helping advance other volunteers within that network to give them more leadership experience, more mentorship experience, more event planning experience, uh, which hopefully benefits them back to their careers. Uh, I'm based in New Jersey and super happy to be here. Amazing. Um, and when you're done, feel free to pass it off to our next speaker. I'll just call on Melissa for now. Thank you, Kelly. Kelly said it all really well. Um, my name is Melissa Conrad. Um, my daytime job is a full stack developer for a furniture chain on the West Coast. And now I am a senior director for um, mostly the United States central region. <laughs> and I'm located in Dallas, Fort Worth uh, Metroplex. Amazing. Thank you, Melissa. And last but not least, Katerina. Hi, I'm Katerina. Uh, I'm with the Portland Network. Uh, my full-time job is I teach computer science at Portland State University. Um, and uh, in terms of volunteering, uh, the Women Who Code Portland team has, has always had, um, I think, a lot of members. And so um, obviously, like, working with all of our directors to kind of, like, manage and um, grow that team as much as possible. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited. It's been a while since I've gotten to see your faces live, but I see you all the time on Slack and over email. So really excited to have this conversation. Um, Kelly really started us off by sharing what the role is of senior director. Um, I just wanted to know if you all can share what skills you've gained in volunteering that you haven't had the chance to build maybe earlier on in your career. So I know as an engineering manager, Kelly, you you practice a lot of these skills day to day, but um, yeah, I'd love to hear more about what you started to develop when you became a, a volunteer. I'll have Kelly go first. I'm just picking on you, Kelly. You're the first face I see. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot. And I've been a, an engineering manager officially for probably like five-ish years um, and then officially a little bit longer. Uh, so I have been doing it a while, but I've been involved in various uh, volunteer activities that entire time. And I really think that they are what set me up for success. Um, I mean, conflict management is one that comes to mind, uh, both as a woman who code director. And I also taught a girls who code class uh, one summer. I, I've actually used that in interviews, which is something I recommend to people when they're considering getting involved in volunteering with women who code is you can use your experiences here, especially as like a manager with like dealing with people. So like when I get a question, like, tell me about a time that you managed a conflict. And I'm like, let me tell you about having 22 teenage girls ages 11 to 18 for seven and a half hours a day in the summer. I was like, it's just a whole different level of uh, different experiences that you just don't get in the workplace that really create like a a better foundation for you to be able to understand and work with different personalities, different ages, different types of people, different experience levels. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when it comes to um, interacting with that many children. I feel like outside of teaching, you don't really get that experience so much. Um, what about you, Melissa? What are some skills or um, kind of things that you improved upon just in your day-to-day -day volunteering role? Yes, definitely. Um, I have improved leadership skills and speaking skills and networking skills. Um, my job, my current daytime job is remote. And so being able to volunteer connects me with people that I would not normally have met, uh, but now we are meeting under like a common goal and people know so much and it's been really enlightening. 
Amazing. Yes. And the reason I am posing this question is because I feel like a lot of people, and maybe this resonates with some of our audience members, a lot of people come to volunteering because it's something that makes them feel good. And it's something that um, they're just really called to participate in building community. Or if you volunteer at an animal shelter, you just want to play with some dogs. Or if you want to work with kids, um, you get these experiences. But we want to focus on how that can contribute and enhance your own professional career. With that, I'll, um, I will bring it to Katerina, who I think has been volunteering much longer than any of us with uh, Women Who Code. So Katerina, I'd love to hear about your experience. Um, yeah, I mean, I just want to echo what both Kelly and Melissa said. I think, um, you know, like conflict resolution is a big one. Um, it's always like once once you start like sort of growing a team, I think, um, you know, you just have a lot of people to manage. And obviously, like if you if that's not part of your daily job, that's like a huge opportunity to like learn how to do all that. Um, our team has had, you know, from anywhere from like 15 to like 30 people. And so obviously like there's, um, there's kind of like, I guess a team of like directors to kind of like um, help manage everyone and figure out how to like deal with different things. Um, I think also uh, just um, event organization. I mean, it's just been really fun to put a lot of different types of events together. Um, doing like hackathons, doing talks, um, getting speakers um, that, you know, you've always wanted to sort of like hear, getting them to like come to your city pre-pandemic. I guess now we can just do Zoom. Um, so there's just a lot of opportunities to do a lot of cool things. And I think, you know, when people ask like, like what, what is like, what will I learn from like volunteering? You know, I think people have a lot of like different answers, but I think it's also sort of like what you put into it because there's a lot of opportunities to like whatever skills you want to hone, um, you can figure out like a specific event or series or project around that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, being a volunteer, being a, a leader in your community gives you those opportunities to um, do whatever you want. So as someone who manage volunteers. I, I really love to empower volunteers to follow their hearts and do what feels right and do what's exciting to you, um, all in support of the mission. And I think that's one of the most exciting things is that you don't get to do that in your day-to-day -day role. You don't get to be as innovative as a software engineer or engineering manager or a professor, um, but you can really be creative in how you'd like to um, expand and work with your community. And that's that's one thing that I really see in our volunteers. And I feel like it opens up this world that you didn't know existed. Um, or maybe it helps you discover passions that um, you didn't know that you had. So for example, you might have the opportunity to create a new website or create a graphic for an event. Um, and that might lead you down a path of um, you know, expanding that area of your skills. So um, these are all really amazing and, and kind of bring us to our next question of um, what opportunities has volunteering opened up within your own career? And so I know that's kind of a big question and I'm happy to, to kick that off. But um, many years ago, I was a volunteer with Women Who Code before I joined full-time. And through that, I uh, ended up really helping my my team diversify. Um, when I joined, there were two other women on the team, not a lot of diversity. Um, and I just by attending and hosting Women Who Code events locally, um, I found people to join our team. I helped um, start an, an employee resource group in my organization and all of these great things came out of it. Um, but I, I would love to hear from the panel, just how is giving back uh, really shaped or opened up opportunities for you within your your career. I will bring it to Melissa first. Give Kelly a break. Yes. So um, when I attend an event or host an event I, and I hear other people's journeys, it really inspires me. And it, it inspires like all the career possibilities or all the different activities that we can do. Um, I've met so many influential people and I usually follow up with like a LinkedIn request and uh, with a message with how we met and all these people have been so supportive and so kind and they're always offering to help with resources and to answer questions because I always have a lot of questions <laughs> and sometimes these connections make other connections and that always helps 
whatever, whatever um, group that I volunteer for, you, you never know what those connections can bring to if you're having an event and you're looking for someone. Uh, it's, it's great. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Just a network of connections. Um, I just see a really relevant comment in the chat from Jessica. Volunteering is a great way to navigate to find a niche in the ocean that is technology. That's very poetic and also very true. Um, what about you, Katarina? Yeah, so I, uh, as uh, you mentioned earlier, I have been volunteering with Women Who Code for a while, um, going on 10 years next year. Um, so I think there's been a lot of different, uh, very cool things. Um, I think, you know, meeting a lot of people and also those people, um, you know, I ended up working with at one point or another. Um, I have my full-time job, but I've also done consulting on the side. And I think there's been like a lot of consulting opportunities that have come through people that I've met at different events. Um, I also, uh, I think in the, when I first started volunteering with Women Who Code, I think that's kind of like what set me up to do a lot more public speaking. I think it was something that I was like mortally afraid of. Um, but all of a sudden I had to do a little bit of that at the beginning of events. And then I just got more comfortable and I ended up speaking at opportunities and um, I've actually gotten a couple of different invitations to speak at different conferences. Um, so that was really fun, not sort of like having to go through the whole like application process. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I think just, you know, I think as Melissa mentioned before, uh, it's a huge opportunity to do networking, uh, to find people uh, in the industry who whose trajectory um, you want to like emulate. Um, so lots of opportunities. Yes, absolutely. I would echo the um, the public speaking bit as well. I I don't know if that's true. I feel like Melissa and Kelly, to me, you seem like natural speakers, <laughs> but I, I definitely identify with the um, initial fear of public speaking and having to push myself out of my comfort zone in order to do that. And it, it definitely got easier with time. And now Katarina is a teacher. So <laughs> public speak on a very regular basis. Um, Kelly, did you want to answer this one? Yeah, I'll just, I'll keep this one quick because I completely agree with the public speaking one. So public speaking is not something that I really struggled with like earlier on in my life, but virtual public speaking was horrible, right? And I led so many events virtually that I joke nowadays that like, there's literally nothing that could happen that would stress me out at this point. And that made me so much better at interviews, right? So every time I get on the call and I'm talking to somebody and I'm telling a story, I just feel significantly more comfortable than I was before. So I'm putting a, doing a better job of representing myself. Um, and we did a event series. We actually still have it going on. Um, that was all practicing algos live. So we would start with like someone practicing it in front of other people. And then those, everyone in the, who's participating would be like, go to breakout rooms and do it themselves. Talk about like getting over the fear of having people watch you as you code because you're doing it in a zero stakes environment. No, no one is greeting you. You know, there's no job on the line, but you're getting the practice and you're doing the reps and that's what really creates that comfort. So that has absolutely been a game changer for me. Absolutely. And I feel like that's a quotable quote, a very meta uh, conversation of public speaking in a virtual event is terrifying, I believe you said, <laughs> as you were doing that. Um, yes, absolutely. Plus one to that. Um, just having to navigate the the change from in-person, kind of getting comfortable with everything, volunteering in person. And then um, I know a lot of us on the call had to make that transition to online events. And now we're doing a mix of both and um, being really, having to be flexible in, in the environment is, is really something that is a challenge. Um, all of this, all of like this pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, putting in a lot of time and effort into something that isn't your day-to-day -day job, even if it is building skills for things that you'll use in your day-to-day -day job. How are you finding the balance um, between volunteer community commitments uh, alongside, you know, professional re responsibilities? I, I know that you can align a lot of the same goals, but I'd love to hear a little bit about balance. Who would like to take this one first? Katerina, how about you? since you've been doing this the longest. Sure. <laughs> um, balance is always hard. I feel like no matter what you do, balance is hard because 
you're like, oh, well, next week I'll be less busy. And then next week gets there and you're like, how did my calendar come up? Um, so I, I do think this is another thing that you can sort of like practice. Obviously, um, the more times you like overextend yourself, the more you like learn and then you do less of it. Um, but I think a big part of it is really um, leaning on like building a team and leaning on members of that team. And so, um, you know, with large events, you need like an entire team of people to put it together to like, you know, take take on different parts of it. Um, but also, you know, I think every single volunteer, um, one of the things we stress a lot in Portland is that we don't want you to just to, to spend years as a volunteer. We want you to become a leader. And so um, we sort of stress that quite a lot because I think it's important um, for the strength of our overall team um, that people can feel empowered to take something on. Um, and also that just makes it a little bit easier overall in terms of the time commitment for our like directors because um, we are sort of sharing the load of a lot of that work amongst the whole team. So I think that's been probably the easiest thing um, in terms of like finding more balance, just like learning to um, to work together and to um, collaborate on various different things. Absolutely. Delegating to a team. You know, there's the additional challenge of delegating to other volunteers as you're a volunteer and everyone can do whatever they'd like, but um, that definitely helps with that balance. What about you, Melissa? Yes, I agree with uh, Katarita that definitely um, as we onboard new leaders, we do say we understand that you are a volunteer and we are aware that there are other things going on and that um, the more, like uh, Katarina said, like the more people we bring on board, the more that we can share um, the workload and see what um, the volunteers' goals are and how we can support them and, and yes. <laughs> yes, incredible. Um, I, I definitely agree with finding uh, finding things that match other people's interests, super important. Kelly, go ahead. I mean, yeah, delegation is the number one answer, um, but I'll add to it a little bit because I think this is a really good skill set for people to uh, build, uh, which is prioritization. I feel like especially when you're earlier in your career, you're only given as much work as it can actually get done and you are expected to get all of it done. Um, I could show you the list of things on my to-do list today that did not get done. And a lot of them were important things, but you just, you have to make decisions about what is worth your time and what is going to give you results and adding volunteer opportunities is the same thing. So it's like, where, where is my time and energy investment going to give us the most bang for our buck? And that comes down to like, what do you really care about? So as a volunteer, it's like, do you want to have a really great event? Cool. Invest your time in that. Do you want to bring more people into the community? Cool. Like how do we uh, market ourselves? How do we like get in front of more eyes? Uh, so it's really, it's the delegation and the prioritization and the learning to accept that you will not get everything done. And I promise you that's okay. Yes. Yes. I feel like you're touching on a really important topic that I heard across everyone's answers, but how do you set goals for yourself? Um, you know, in your day-to-day -day role, you might have organizational strategic goals that you're trying to meet or a manager whose manager's manager is telling you, you know, what different tasks must get done, but within volunteering, how are you setting those those personal goals of um, remembering your your why and, and why you're there. Um, do you want to speak on that, Kelly? Since you were showing us your your list. Yeah, uh, that was that's a combination list. <laughs> that's everything. Um, yeah, for me, I guess there's like two pieces of it, which is one is the like how do you actually come up with the goals, and then the other is like how do you keep tuning into like what actually matters to you. Um, for me, it has always will always be people, and I know that like that's I I'm not interested in doing anything in a box like by myself. I wanna be working with people. So I kind of, and I encourage other leaders, like if we have like a director who's coming back from leave of absence or something like that, I always start with like, just schedule time with the people, ask them questions, like ask, you know, our leads, our directors, our members questions, like, how are they doing? What are they liking? What are their pain points? Just like connect it back to people. Cause I think that's why we're all here in the first place. And then setting the goals, I will say is honestly a really hard one. And that is one I admittedly overshot multiple times and probably continue to as a director and now a senior director. And it's something I try to coach other people not to do. Um, I think it comes back again to like 
it's if the goals are going to help you do do the things that you want to be doing then they're beneficial and otherwise it's not about the goal it's about like what are you trying to improve like there's so many different metrics here like you alluded to this earlier that like this is the nice thing about being a volunteer organization versus like work is like if I'm like I want to hire an intern at work it's like it took me like six weeks to do it if I'm like I want to try this new program within the women who code NYC community it takes me as long as it takes me there's just opportunity. It's nothing but opportunity. So I'd say it's coming back to those, like, what are the opportunities that feel motivating to me right now? What will I feel like really, uh, really good having achieved? Yeah. I feel like so much of it is related to what feels good, what feels exciting, what feels like it's making an impact or making a difference in my personal life. And, um, I think I've had this conversation with Melissa before of, um, just, hearing what other people have to say in the community and, and getting input from them too. Um, Melissa, I'd love to hear more about uh, just your goal setting within Dallas-Fort Worth or how you are prioritizing and, and delegating those tasks. I do. Um, I agree with Kelly. Um, the people, and I, I love meeting with people and seeing what their goals are and how I can support them. Like, what are they really passionate about? Because I feel if someone doesn't have that drive, it's really hard to reach that goal. And then once once we figure out that goal and then we set a date and that's what drives me. I like <laughs> I like numbers, I like order. And so that's, that's what, how I help them reach their goals. Absolutely. Anything you wanna to add to that, Katarina? Actually, I think so. Um, so, um... <laughs> Uh, I don't even know how to phrase this, but uh, in terms of like goal settings, both with work and also um, with women who code, I think something that's helped me kind of like understand in terms of like, what is it that I like really want to accomplish? What is it that I like need to prioritize in terms of like accomplishments is really coming up with like, um, I don't know how to explain this. Um, <laughs> it was actually explained to me by like a therapist and I was like, this is brilliant. But of course, like I don't actually have like all the right words. But I think um, if you put together like a personal code in terms of like, how do you want to be like perceived? What do you want to like be proud of at the end of like this time period? I think you just need to sort of to pick those things and then to kind of like, work towards that because like once you kind of like narrow down what like your personal code is I think it's just a little bit easier to to sort of like figure out what areas you really want to prioritize um and where you want to put all your time in because of course like you can set we've probably all at one point or another set new year's resolutions or any other type of goal and then you get to the end of the year and you're like wow that one really did not work out um because I think it's so easy to, to come up with too many things or it's so easy not to like break it down in terms of like actual, like actionable things. Um, and so that's just kind of like one way to kind of like really figure out what you want to hone in on. Um, and then of course, I mean, <laughs> in terms of actually accomplishing the goal, um, I think really breaking things down into smaller pieces and into pieces that you can get, um, that you can get accomplished. You can't plan a, an event all by yourself in like one day. You really have to like break down the different pieces and like get someone to sort of like work through all that. And I think that's kind of like with a lot of initiatives, with a lot of projects as well. And so, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I think a lot of people resonate with the um, the New Year's resolutions or setting temporary uh, sometimes very short term goals for themselves, but the idea of a personal code is is new for me, and I I really think that could be um, something that people benefit from. Um, I'm definitely more of a, a woo woo person. I like vision boards, you know, um, manifesting. Uh, <laughs> but I I definitely think that um, making yourself proud and focusing on um, things that that you'll reflect on at the end of the year, at the end of the quarter, whenever is, um, is something that you can do in your personal life. And it doesn't just have to be a goal that's set for you in your day-to-day -day role. Um, thank you all for sharing that. Um, I'm, I, I know a lot of people who are joining us here today, or might be listening to this later, um, might be 
newer in their career, newer in their role, newer in their company, um, and they might not consider themselves an expert or consider themselves um, not worthy, but, you know, ready to, to be a mentor, to be a leader in their community, to be a volunteer. Um, how, how can people give back, um, you know, what are, what are a few examples of giving back when you're not ready to be at that senior director level yet? Or on the flip side, if you want to give someone a pep talk to jump in and, and push themselves out of their comfort zone, that works too. Who would like to take this, Kelly? I mean, I'll start with the the expectation that you have to be an expert to do something, because if we do, then I'm sorry, I have to resign because I'm not an expert in any of this. Um, I'm just a person doing their best. I think we have this like sense that to succeed in our careers and to succeed in these places, we need to be led by someone who's in front of us. But that's just not reality. Like, I've never had like an actual mentor or someone who was like in front of me leading me along. So instead, what I did was like, create things for the people who were with me and for us to move forward. And that's, you know, the events that Melissa and Katerina are talking about, like, they don't have to be, you don't have to put together an event where you are the smartest person in the room. I mean, frankly, I hope you don't, you just need to put it together and bring different minds and ideas together. Um, to that point, I would say the most important aspect is like, just be willing to do things. Um, this is, you know, these are not our jobs. Um, I, have enough hours in the day where I have to like figure out what to tell people to do. I'm not doing it during the women who code hours. I will support any great initiatives and ideas that people have, but uh, I'm not going to give orders. Right. So if you're willing to do some work and do some, you know, brainstorming, just showing up to things, actually, I'm going to stop my entire answer and say, please just show up to things. Like it's really cannot be overstated that just like showing up to an event is giving so much more to your community than you think it is. Yes, I agree. I feel like just motivated by everyone who's having a conversation in the chat while we're having this conversation is that you all just showed up and you're really actively engaging and participating and um, hopefully having some takeaways, if not from the conversation, then from the conversation you're having with each other and the people that you're meeting throughout this event. So yes, I'm also very comforted by what you said, Kelly, about um, not being an expert no one knows what they're doing. And I find that very comforting. Um, how about you, Katarina? What would you like to share? I would just like to upvote what Kelly said. Um, I mean, it can't be stated enough. Um, I think, you know, just being willing to, um, to help with an event, being willing to like put something together. Um, and I can also like give you an example, um, because as it turns out, our, um, our algorithm, our algorithm, I can't remember the exact series name because we've changed it a few different times, but I think it's algorithmic interviews um, study night. She actually started the event series because she wanted to like learn how to do algorithms. Um, and she's been doing it for several months now. And um, as it turns out, she ended up becoming an expert in it. Um, she ended up getting several job offers as a result of just getting just getting really familiar with the stuff. And so, I mean, this is like one of those things where like it benefits, you know, the person doing all of this work, but it also really benefits our community because then so many people get to participate in those events and learn and also hopefully um, become experts and, you know, get, get that job. I love, I love success stories like that. And it all, again, going back to what Kelly said, it all starts with showing up and, you know, having a little bit of um, encouragement from yourself that even though you're not an expert, you can still make an impact and you can learn something new. And that's, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing, Katerina. Melissa, anything you yes. want to add? Yes, I would like to add, I also saw in the chat earlier when we were talking about networking and I want to add like socializing and trying to get past that initial like icebreaker or like hi you know this is my name and then how to keep that conversation going and one way is you can whatever group that you're volunteering for they may have some sort of group chat like a slack or a LinkedIn group and then you could just join and then you never know like you might you could ask your questions there or you could help someone else someone else might have a question that you might have an answer to or resources and it I've seen that how we've helped each other and it's really great <laughs> it builds that camaraderie and 
just the insight and the resources that are there to help each other. Absolutely. And I think it's also um, less pressure to do that, to just kind of put something out there into the the internet and see if something happens, um, see if someone can weigh in. Thank you all for sharing. These are so helpful. Um, I wanted to add that another way that, that you could give back if you feel like you don't have the time to volunteer, which a hundred percent, there are so many people. I don't have small children. I have one dog and I still find that it's hard to make the time outside of full-time work and, you know, friendships and relationships to, to give back. Um, I found as I've gotten, um, more experience in my career that donating is one way that I feel like I can be part of an organization without giving my time. I would love to hear, um, if any of you have experience with that and I know volunteering, you're putting in your time, your effort, you are really making a difference. The same can be true with donate donating, um, in the form of you are giving someone that support to carry out their mission in whatever way they seem fit. So, um, who would like to chat? I think Kelly, we've had conversations about donating, so I am going to pick on you for this one. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, I I'm trying to even figure out where to tackle this question from. So I, I view donating in like a lot of different ways. It's been a part of my like financial strategy for years. Um, I have like a little Excel sheet where I keep track of everything. I like make sure, you know, once a year that like, are these things that I'm donating money to on a regular basis, like still match my values? Like, are they still the places that I feel best about that money going? Cause you know, like if you, you know, it might be like a hundred bucks, but you, you know, like in your heart, if like, this is like, I'm happy with this choice that I'm making or I'm not. Um, and I'm a big believer in when you can doing it locally. So I mentioned in the chat earlier that like I volunteer at my local bookstore, it's an independent bookstore, a collective. So like, I also, you know, will donate money to them. I donate money to, there's a music foundation here in town that um, puts on a bunch of free performances, but then also uh, helps fund music education for young underprivileged students those things make my heart nice. I feel the same way about women who code. It's like, this is the closest, the closest possible thing I could have to my actual career. And like making sure that like the opportunities and the privileges that I've been given do not go to waste and that I'm able to pull other people up with me. Kind of like similar to what I said earlier, there's only so many people I can talk to. There's only so many people I can personally mentor or personally get jobs or get internships or help them along. But the funds, like just being a financial contributor means it's spread to everyone. I don't need to know them personally. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you don't need to know them personally and you don't need to work full time at your favorite nonprofit. I'm lucky <laughs> enough to do that, but I know that it's not possible for everyone, but contributions to a local community or an organization that means something to you um, does help other people who are doing that in their full-time job. So absolutely. Um, Katerina or Melissa, go ahead, Katerina. I think um, it's sort of been the same for me. I think um, I've, uh, over the last few years, I've really, like all of my donations have been fairly local um, because I think you get to know like various different organizations and you kind of like want to support the community where you live. Um, I, uh, more recently, I've also um, just also started donating in terms of like local journalism um, because I know that's um, <laughs> having, there's just, you know, like cuts and um, difficulties um, at a lot of like smaller papers in terms of like making sure they have reporters. And I think it's really important to have that um, in terms of like accountability and all of that. Um, but I think also, you know, as with everything, like things that you're really passionate about, I think it's available in your community. And so you can find that and you can support that. Um, and I, 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 I love it um, because I, you know, you kind of also like meet other people through like various like events they might put on um, through various like newsletters. And so it's, yeah, you also get to like make friends locally. Yes, absolutely. Giving your however many dollars or euros or pesos to someone in your community or someone that you know, or an organization that is meaningful to you, it, it hits very differently than giving Jeff Bezos another $5, right? Um, he, has, he doesn't need it. So I fully agree. Um, Melissa, how about you? Yes, I, I also like to donate locally. And I also donate to like um, bigger or organizations like the American Heart Association. It's just seeing where those donations go and what 
like Kelly said, it funds for a, a larger group of people that I can't personally like do myself. <laughs> and so that makes me feel good to see that and then see where, where what they accomplish with those goals, uh, with those uh, donations. Yes, definitely. And and larger organizations and nonprofits usually have annual reports. So you can look back and feel like, oh, I contributed to this. That's really exciting. Um, I'll just share a little plug that you can donate to Women Who Code, womenwhocode.com slash donate. And then throughout the month of September, we have a fundraiser called Women Who Code to the Finish Line. And we'll have teammates sharing that in the chat. Thank you, Molly, um, who will share how you can get involved if you're interested, um, but your contributions really make all of our work possible. So thank you. If you are able to give, really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to get back to um, a conversation about, um, I think I think everyone has shared um, anecdotes about other volunteers or other people you've met in your community, but I'd love to hear more stories before we get into the Q&A. Um, if the if you have uh, stories of how your community efforts have inspired or supported someone in your community, um, and I can just give a quick one. Um, this this was about ten years ago when I lived in New York and I was a volunteer there for Women Who Code. Um, I led a resume writing workshop that was my expertise at the time, and like three different people got jobs in a couple of months afterwards, and all of them wrote me hand hand wrote thank you cards and delivered them to my work and. I just remember just crying. I was so, I was so moved and I was so happy to get nothing beats a handwritten card, but really just um, hearing the impact of like just one event that I did not want to do after work that day, I, I strongly remember um, can, can go a long way and really make an impact in someone's life. So um, yeah, any, it doesn't have to be a story that makes you cry, but <laughs> um, any, any impact stories that you want to share? Katerina, go ahead. I have one, and it's actually from last week. Um, and this isn't uh, this wasn't like a women who code event, but it was just like kind of we've all a lot of our leadership has sort of like become friends. We do things outside of like women who code. And so as it turns out, we were doing dinner and watching Twilight at someone's house. Um, and um a lot of Three of the people there were well, obviously me, but also two of our former directors and one of our current leads. Um, she actually brought a bottle of champagne and she said it was the bottle of champagne um, that she got when she bought her house last year. And uh, what she said was that, you know, she didn't even think about you know, going into tech before coming to one of our hackathons as like, um, as a participant. Um, but then she ended up getting into tech, um, volunteering for us and also like prepping for, you know, like a tech career. Um, and uh, she said that before with her job, she thought that she might be able to buy a house by, by age 35, but she was able to do it way before that as, because she's now in tech and she's like able to have like to make significantly more money than she was before. And so it's just, and she wanted to share that bottle of champagne with the leadership of like women who code. Um, and yeah, that was just last week and um, just really awesome. I think, you know, there's been so many stories like that, but that one literally just happened. Um, but I think, you know, it's hard to get into tech. And then it's hard to stay in tech. And so like finding people who are going to support you, like that's so important. Yes, yes. I love that this is a recent story, Katerina, because I feel like you have a very deep well to pull from, but that's a really beautiful one. And I fully agree that um, encouraging someone to stay in the industry is just as important as helping them get in in the first place. So um, absolutely love that. Thank you for sharing. Kelly, do you want to share any stories? Yeah, I this this really okay. So lesson for all of us. I feel very uncomfortable saying this because it feels like I'm bragging about myself, but it is these are true stories. Um, I've gotten a lot of people hired. I've gotten not always specifically women who code, but like one was like from like a tech networking event that was for women, um, where I met somebody who then became uh I was 
uh, this was years ago, I was advocating for like hiring an intern as like an entry level person. And I'm like, let's do like an apprenticeship. Let's take someone from an underrepresented group. Let's take someone who's a career changer, um, like give them six months, see how they do. And it is tooth and nail had to fight for this with my boss. Um, she is still employed at that company. So she has been there for years. Um, I got another woman who was one of my girls who co student an internship at that job. Um, so, and then she went on to be a computer science major. And then this year, uh, one of my old girls who code students from years ago reached out to me at the beginning of summer and I got her an internship at this company. And that sounds, I don't know how many of you have experience with trying to get your companies to do internships, but like it really did fight tooth and nail for all of these. Um, and I, it's like the thing I'm proudest of of my career. Uh, the other light one I'll say is like my fellow directors now who most of them were leads that I promoted into directors. Um, they are my friends, but I also consider them like a bit of mentees. You'll have to ask them if they consider me a mentor, but I spend a lot of time on phone calls with them talking about their careers and just using the skill kind of like both ways, like using the skills that I have from work and from doing like this people management stuff to just give them context and give them support and give them ideas and, you know, just love. Like that's the, it's the group uh, dynamic and the people that you meet and become very invested in. And that really does go both ways. Absolutely. And you are not bragging. And even if you were, <laughs> you deserve to brag. And I feel I think... like all hot because I'm like, oh, that was so uncomfortable. I don't think I've ever done that. <laughs> it's the virtual public speaking doing it yes. to you. Not the bragging. <laughs> um, that's amazing. I I completely resonate with that. I feel like everyone I ever hired, I feel like somehow being part of their journey is super I'm very honored to be part of it. And I feel like you can be proud of that. So thank you for sharing. Melissa, you've already shared some stories, but I'd love to hear more. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, uh, some stories that come to mind, uh, um, talking about connections again, um, some events that I hosted connected people that um, like they went to a coding boot camp, and then another member was like, oh, you went to this coding boot camp, or you were in this accelerated coding program. And then they connected and were able to share like what to expect and what the pro how to get into the program and these people were able to get into the program and one person has now graduated and it has now been employed through this program just through these connections and then talking back to connections another volunteer group or another group that I volunteer for I started walking with my friend here and she said oh we have this job board you should check it out so I checked it out and I didn't see a position for myself but I knew that in our network there were people looking for QA jobs so I just posted them I'm like hey these are some jobs from this job board and I know I have a colleague and it turns out um one of the members uh the the company that they work for had a restructuring. So a lot of people uh, were unfortunately laid off and they said, hey, I have someone to recommend. And they sent me the information and I connected with him on LinkedIn. And then I shared it with my colleague. And then we've both been cheering him on and he's gotten through his first interview. And she was so funny. She's like, anyone that's a friend of Melissa's is a friend of mine. And I was talking to her, I was like, I don't really know him, but we're like, yeah, you can do it. And so I feel like that's a success success story, and I'm I'm totally a cheerleader. I just want people to succeed. That's very exciting, and I I definitely know you to be a natural cheerleader. But I think everyone on this call, and also everyone in the chat, would be so thrilled to help someone else land a job or help someone else practice for an interview, tweak their resume. Um, you know, I I'm sure as as volunteers or as leaders in your community, you've also have the opportunity to be someone's reference on a job call. That's really fun to do. It's so easy. And it's also a chance for you to brag about someone that you know and their accomplishments and how great they are to work with. Um, so that's another example of uh, the impact that you can make just through um, these experiences that you are making yourself do after work hours or maybe you know on the weekends at times, but it does pay off and it does help really um, help other people in your community in so many different ways. Thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciated um, your wealth of knowledge on this subject. Um, I'm so excited that we were able to get all three of you on this call and to share uh, the impact that you've made in your careers and 
um, in your communities and how many people you've been able to support throughout the year. So thank you so much, everyone.